In this video, I'm going to introduce feature geometry. This is a non-linear phenology. In other words, it is a theory of phenology that is no longer linear like SPE phenology was, otherwise known as the sound patterns of English phenology, which is the rule-based phenology where you had something like A goes to B in the environment of X and Y. We are now going to ditch this and move into the realm of feature geometry. And essentially, this says that stress, syllables, and features are all hierarchical. And we can talk about things like affricates in terms of having these contradictory features. And what do I mean by contradictory features? Well, an affricate is really just a consonant that has a minus continuant component, and then it's followed by a plus continuant component. So like ch, for instance, well, the t is the minus continuant, the ch the, is the plus continuant, and together it makes ch. So with feature geometry, we can talk about our consonants and vowels in these kinds of terms with this tree-like structure. In fact, I think the best way to see why we need it is to take a look at something like nasal place assimilation. And we'll go through this example, we'll try it in SPE, I'll show you what the feature tree looks like. And then we'll see how we can use that sort of tree-like structure in order to capture this problem and process in just a really cool and elegant way. So what is nasal place assimilation? Well, I want to write some words out. I want to write the words ink, intelligent, and the word input. In fact, I always spell input incorrectly because of the phonology going on. So what's happening? Well, in the word ink, that N is not an N, it is a velar N, so ink. It is the same one in the first rule, ink. It is assimilating to the place of the K. So this alveolar N becomes a velar N before a velar intelligent yeah you have that alveolar n staying as alveolar because it's before an alveolar t in the word input when we emphasize it we have an al alveolar but in fast speech we would say input and this n becomes a bilabial because the following sound is bilabial now in spe phonology we need three different rules because we have these place features these unary features door core and lab but these all have to be written as three different processes. But that doesn't make too much sense because this nasal place assimilation, it's a pretty common pattern. In fact, this is a very, very big process that happens in many different languages. This isn't just English. This is in tons of different languages. And it's all the same sort of assimilation. It is place assimilation. This one set of sound, this N, is assimilating to the place of the next sound. So why is this one process shown in three different rules as if it were three completely different things? In fact, what this says when we have three different rules is this makes a prediction about languages. It makes a prediction that there is some language out there that doesn't have one of these rules, but would have the other two. So if we have three different rules, we can say, well, maybe this one language just has rule one, rule two, and not rule three. But again, this doesn't make any sense because nasal place assimilation is an all or nothing pattern we see in different languages. There aren't languages that just have one or the other. You see assimilation to all places that they have in their phonemic inventory. So is there some way to generalize it in SPE phonology? Yeah. In fact, this came about very quickly after it was identified as a problem as having three different rules because people were like, hey, wait, no, this is, this is one process. So we should have one rule. And to fix this, they added this, <laughs> they added this feature called place. And this is an entry feature, which means that it's not just plus or minus. It has different values. Because one of the place values is dorsal, one of the place values is labial, one of the place values is coronal. So in order to do this, we'd say that these nasal consonants change to the place. So this is called alpha place. This, is, this alpha is a variable, so I'll write this in the same color, that whatever place the following sound is, we're going to have the nasal also becoming that place. And 
you know, this was treated as a very elegant solution for quite a bit. We're saying, wow, we, we introduced uh, this kind of variable in our SPE rules. So we can say, okay, this nasal becomes this specific place because the following consonant is also that place. Now, of course, uh, there's some problems with it. And one of the big problems is that, well, if we do alpha place, then we've lost this notion of these unary features, coronal, dorsal, and labial, that phonologists have fought for for quite a long time. And we also kind of lost the whole binarity of features. I mean, if we can have these place features that have more than just plus or minus values, then can't we have different levels of voice and different levels of sonority and different levels of stridency in our features? Um, why is it just place that has this special property? It seems like we're kind of taking this really strict and tight system and saying, uh, wait, we need something to capture generalizations of language more, so let's make this one exception, and we'll just accept this exception and try not to do it with other things. But uh, what happens when you do this with place is that then morphonologists say, well, let's do it with this feature instead, because if we have these variables, then we can account for this other set of data better. And this is kind of problematic in the system, because the whole point of the system was to say, okay, unary binary features, there's some feature changes. Uh, the system wasn't really built to account for these higher place values, these unary place values that are greater than unary and binary features. Now, some people still like SP phonology. I'm not going to convince you not to use it, but what I do want to show you is an alternative analysis called feature geometry. So here is the feature tree. And although this is written 2D, this is a three-dimensional tree. And it consists of many components, but essentially we still have all the features we used to, but instead of just being in a matrix list, it is now a hierarchical tree that we can pick apart and we can look at in terms of different branches and leaves. So for instance, we have a root, and in the root of every sound is the consonant and sonority features. So is it is it a consonant? Is it sonorous? Um, I should mention above that above this root we have things like syllables, moras, feet, etc. Uh, we won't focus on that yet, but it also accounts for tone and other things. This is just below the consonant and vowel tier. And then from the root, it breaks into features like nasal continuant lateral, as well as laryngeal features. So it classifies constricted glottis, spread glottis, and voice under the same hood, essentially. Because these are all three things that are going on in our throats. So these laryngeal settings are essentially a bunch of features that relate to your larynx, and they're bundled together. Similarly with place features, well, we have this category of place features, and then under each place we have different places. So is it labial, is it coronal, is it dorsal? And then those respected features are hosted in those uh, nodes, essentially. So round is the daughter of the labial feature. Anterior and distributed are daughters of the coronal feature, or coronal section, I guess. Dorsal, high, low, and back, they're part of that dorsal section. And those labial, coronal, dorsal are part of the place section. So, uh, Memorizing this tree is partly necessary, but for the most part, when you take a look at specific problems, you usually reference the entire tree and you figure out which ones you need. And I want to demonstrate nasal place assimilation with individual sounds, and then we can generalize. So usually with these feature trees, it's a lot of work to write out the entire tree. So we only write out, once again, what we need. Kind of just like with SP phonology, we just write out the features we need. So this N, for instance, it's a sonorous consonant, it is a nasal, it has voice, its place is coronal, and it has plus anterior minus distributed. So we can see this hierarchy here. Now with the K, the K is a consonant, but it's not sonorous. It's dorsal, it is plus high, minus, low, and minus back. So how can we capture nasal place assimilation? with this N and this K. Lewis, how can we make this NK go to an um K, the velar N and a K? Well, we can do something called spreading and delinking. So what's happening here is that the N is losing its place value. Its place is just getting slashed off of its tree, and the place value of the neighboring sound is being spread to the N. 
So kind of what's happening here is all of this place information has now left the N and it has adopted all of the place features and specifications of the K, but it's still retaining its voice and nasality from before because it only cut off the place feature. So in other words, these super laryngeal settings, or sorry, the larynx settings here for voice and the nasality which connect to the new road or the root node have not been touched, but the place feature has been removed and it's been adapted by the K. So this is a very specific example. And of course, this means that this is now an mm. But if we can do it with a specific example, we can do it with general examples as well. So let's say we have any nasal followed by any consonant. And here's the bare bones for a nasal and consonant. A nasal is a plus consonantal plus sonorant. It has this nasal property and it's going to have some place wherever that is. The consonant is a plus cons minus sonorant. It has a place value, voicing, nasality, maybe, doesn't matter. But to generalize nasal place assimilation, what we're saying is when we have any nasal followed by any consonant, what happens is the nasal loses its place and it adopts the place of the following consonant. So this is what a rule looks like in feature geometry. This is the rule right here. There is no A goes to B in the environments of X and Y. We list the trees side by side as general as we can make them. We cut off a branch and we spread another branch over to the neighboring sound. So notice here, we only cut off the place. And because it no longer has place, it has to find place from the neighboring sound. So the place on the neighboring sound spreads to the end. So if the C, if this is labial underneath it, then that nasal is going to be labial. If the place is coronal, then the nasal is going to be coronal. If it's dorsal, then the nasal is going to be dorsal. Uh, if it's a uh, radical somehow, then that would mean that the end becomes a radical. So this is the power of feature geometry. And this is just one example. In the next video, we're going to do um, a lot more examples with some very basic uh, phenomena that don't require a syllable T or anything, just so we can take a look at more rules and how these things attach and detach. But really, the question is, well, what can be modeled in FG? What can be modeled in feature geometry? And the answer is pretty much everything. These basic problems can. Tone can. The CV tier can. We'll talk about the CV tier, essentially just looking at strings of being consonants and vowels. Uh, we can talk about mores and stress. We can talk about syllable structure. We can even talk about feet and prosodic words. And we can do rules that target all of these things in feature geometry using two rules, using spreading and delinking. So again, spreading is taking that feature and sharing it with a neighbor. And then delinking is cutting off those nodes in one of the sounds. So that is the power of feature geometry. If you have any questions about this, please leave them in the comments below and I'll do my best to answer you.